Hello and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Neil Clark with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Today is meant to be an overview of uh, the typical calls we get this time of year uh, r related to fall forest pests. And when I say pests, you may be thinking uh, of arthropods, you know, little insects and, and things. And uh, that is one form of pest. We also have uh, pathogens that can be d determined to be pests. And, um, and by the end of this uh, tape, you'll, you'll understand that this time of year, uh, mammals may be uh, some of our greatest forest pests for the fall and winter time. So to begin, as a review from uh, last time I did the video on what killed my tree, there are um, some main components of a tree that, um, that pathogens or pests can impact that will affect the health of the tree. So those being the leaves, the cambium, which is the living tissue just under the, the bark of the tree, and uh, also the roots. So the leaves, um, as mentioned, this time of year in the fall, the leaves, impact on the leaves is not uh, severely detrimental. In broadleaf trees, uh, those leaves are getting ready to fall anyway. <clears throat> They've pretty much accomplished their purpose for the year. Which in evergreens, they're going to keep uh, their needles, obviously, through, through the winter. Uh, however, the function uh, of those needles is still going to slow uh, quite a bit. So that being said, the foliage can still provide um, some excellent diagnostic information uh, for what's going on with the tree. And this is sort of our last time of year to be able to use the leaves uh, to, to kind of judge what's going on with our with our trees. All right, this is also the leaves that are on the trees now have been there for the entire year. So you have the entire accumulation of all the insect damage, uh, all the uh, pathogens and other damage uh, that have occurred, you know, minus a few uh, new areas where the tree may have flushed some, some newer leaves. But in general, those leaves have been on for several months now and, uh, and tell the tale and hold the scars, if you will, of the entire year. On the coastal plain, by far, the uh, number of calls I receive this time of year are related to fall webworm. The larval stage is when they're growing, so that's when they typically do the most feeding. And when they do the most feeding is when they impact uh, the trees. So fall webworms, as I said, we call them worms, and caterpillars. And, um, and they reside in these uh, webs uh, that are uh, usually encompass the terminal ends of the um, of the branches of small branches and typically the branches that are uh, that are in full sun <clears throat> these web worms have actually been around uh, since the spring uh, but in in Virginia they may uh, have two to four generations so uh, you think about you know ten worms starting in the spring and they reproduce and, and then there's 30 they reproduce and then there's 150 and so on so um, you can see that as the population uh, goes way up we tend to notice uh, these worms do form the encase the the ends of these branches and the they tend to eat all of the foliage within that uh, within that web of course that web provides uh, excellent uh, cover and protection primarily from birds and other predators. So the impact of webworms is primarily aesthetic. Uh, when people look out you see uh, this webbing on the tree. Uh, it, it, well one, it looks like, hey, something is attacking my tree. Uh, and two, it's just, um, you know, again, it's something in the tree that, that you think shouldn't be there. And I have seen cases where entire trees are encased in webs or even entire groups of trees encased in webs and uh, it, it's just quite a visual shock when you see that. In this part of the state, uh, webworms tend to be in pecan trees. Uh, they do impact other trees, uh, but I know in the southeast part of the state, just about every pecan tree you see will have two or three uh, webs, two or three branches that will have webworms. And I have seen them in other species of trees. Since they are mainly an aesthetic problem, if you, if you only have a few branches and you want to prune those, those branch tips out, um, and you can reach them safely uh, or hire an arborist, arborist uh, that's fine just to prune them out of the tree and then they're 
and then they're removed for that for that year. However, in subsequent years, they do fly in as moths uh, to to lay eggs. So um, you're not really going to be able to control future populations just by uh, controlling this year's population. Canker worms, leaf rollers, and loopers also are uh, different kinds of caterpillars uh, that tend to uh, either consume or uh, cut off large uh, quantities of foliage uh, throughout the summer into this this portion of, of the year. Um, and they all kind of have that same impact that unless there's a huge overwhelming uh, number uh, such as when you have a gypsy moth uh, attack um, usually the trees will do fine to to reflush and and continue to grow through that uh, one-time attack people also look at the leaves and notice uh, a lot of uh, either leaf blisters or galls primarily leaf blisters and uh, and dead patches on the leaves uh, could either be a result of, of air quality issue or often a, a bacteria um, or a virus or a fungus of some of some variety. Um, in the eastern part of the United States uh, we do not have any um, pathogens that are uh, overwhelmingly devastating to to forested trees um, and really uh, to a healthy yard tree uh, we don't have any fall time pathogens that would be uh, that would be detrimental. I also mentioned powdery mildew in my last uh, video uh, and that's another thing that uh, you will see uh, come into play where, where you have the moist air of the summertime you have a cool evening then all of a sudden all your leaves turn gray and fuzzy and um, again it's a leaf problem in the fall uh, I have not seen it uh, on evergreens uh, primarily I've seen that uh, on deciduous trees here in southeast Virginia. Another worm we get a lot of calls on this time of year is uh, the bagworms, Thyrodopteryx ephemeriformis. Essentially these, uh, these worms hatch in, in May uh, as small uh, larvae and they, they form a silk and, and fly through the, the spring breezes uh, in a uh, acti action called ballooning. Uh, and that's how they get to the to the next tree over or quite quite a distance uh, depending on the wind that day um, and once they get there they alight and they start to to form form conical bags in the tree on evergreen trees where uh, the tree does not reflush uh, very rapidly and uh, and a large attack will essentially defoliate large portions if not the entire uh, the entire tree. In the late spring and early summer when they are actively feeding uh, you can treat those with a labeled insecticide. In a large tree it is often difficult to get that insecticide through the entire tree uh, without hiring a professional or having uh, specialized equipment and if your tree is in a yard right next to a lot of other neighbors uh, you know sometimes that's uh, uh, somewhat difficult to do that way. Um, Typically though, if it's in a 15 or 20 foot tall tree, uh, you can get uh, product in a hose end sprayer uh, to be able to reach uh, the bulk of that tree. Have small trees or bushes in your yard that you maintain frequently and you notice uh, some of these bags that are, that are in your trees or shrubs, uh, it would be a good practice just to uh, snip them off and remove them uh, before one becomes 1,000. And, uh, next year they will definitely be there hatching and chewing on your shrubs. So this is a good preventative um, pest that you can identify this time of year. The eggs are, uh, are in those little bags over the fall, over winter. And if you remove those eggs, then uh, potentially you remove out of the, that problem uh, this year. Birds, voles, squirrels, rabbits, deer, bear, and, uh, and beaver uh, all impact and damage uh, trees in, in forest. Um, some to major extent, some to a more minor extent. Because of the season, I will limit this to, um, to talking about uh, deer, voles, and beavers. 
Beavers uh, likely require their own entire video, but I will briefly mention, uh, you know, the beavers, uh, it's well known that beavers um, can do extensive uh, damage to, to forests. Um, you know, they can harvest large trees uh, that they use to, to build their dams, and they also uh, harvest many small trees uh, that they use for food and also in you know, the dam and lodge building process. But more importantly than the individual trees that they that they cut um, are the uh, large acreages sometimes of land that they um, that they can take out of productivity uh, due to uh, flooding. It is legal for uh, a landowner to kill beavers that are damaging their property in Virginia. Uh, you can check with your locality, particularly if you're in an urban area, uh, to make sure the legal means of, of doing this, uh, wildlife removal uh, and trapping services that will also um, provide this uh, service for a fee. Deer are typically a problem for small saplings uh, more in the winter time when they're utilizing those small uh, stems uh, and branches of small trees uh, for browse. This time of year, the male deers are preparing for the mating season, or the rut as it is commonly referred, and they do a lot of damage to smaller diameter trees um, due to the fact that they are rubbing their antlers on the trees to, to rub the velvet off and also to, to kind of mark their territory, so to speak. This rubbing often removes uh, over half of the cambium layer of these small one and two inch diameter trees. And so if in the wood situation it's not uh, devastating, but if this is uh, near your yard or, uh, and, and these are your prized trees, then, um, then often uh, we get calls. One thing if you know this is a problem uh, for a certain area of your property, uh, and you have a, a modest amount of, of prized trees, uh, you can utilize uh, fencing or some kind of uh, plastic guard around the stem of that tree uh, during the fall time. Uh, you can remove it in the spring uh, and also just make sure you remove it um, before the tree grows to, uh, to such a size that those uh, guards or fences uh, impede the the growth of the, the diameter growth of the stem. If the deer do uh, severely rub uh, some of your uh, stems that you're desiring, uh, it is often better to wait until spring and then prune that stem off uh, just slightly above the, uh, the soil uh, line in the spring and, uh, and train a new leader. So you'll have sprouts from there, just select one sprout and uh, leave that one to grow. And, uh, and soon uh, you will have that leader off of that rootstock. So um, that is often a much better option than trying to uh, wait for uh, that stem to, to heal itself over. In certain areas of the state, deer uh, do impede natural regeneration quite a bit um, if their populations are exceedingly large. Um, uh, they will clean out everything in the understory um, of a forest. Deer and rabbits often eat a lot of small diameter stems less than the diameter of a pencil uh, or so, uh, particularly in the winter time as food, other food sources are scarce. So if this is the case uh, around your, your home, uh, that's going to be difficult to deal with outside of uh, exclusion fencing. Lastly, voles or field mice don't bop them on the head. We'll um, tend to do a, a vast majority of their damage uh, also in the winter time when food sources are scarce. Uh, the reason I mentioned this in the fall video is now is a good time if you have prized trees or shrubs, small trees or shrubs around your uh, landscaping uh, that you may want to make sure that you pull back uh, the mulch several inches, three to six inches from the base of that stem and make sure that area is exposed. Uh, the voles are much less likely uh, to feed uh, on that stem if they feel like they're exposed to predators. Hopefully there are more trees out there growing than these animals can consume or damage. 
but surely there are some prized, prized stems that will uh, lose the battle each year. Thank you for joining me for another 15 minutes in the forest. Make sure you join us at noon next week when Karen Snape will show you how and when to properly prune your trees. Have a joy-filled journey. See you next week.